Hey there, welcome to The Uplift. We've got a great show for you, a great cast of characters as well, including an 84-year-old who just hit a major milestone, 67 years in the making. We'll tell you what it is, if you can't tell from that picture. A military mom caring for her son with cerebral palsy. She wanted a wheelchair, accessible car. She got a whole lot more. Plus, high school grads correcting the past. They wanted to honor students who should have graduated 80 years ago, but instead of graduation, they got internment camps. We'll tell you what they did to honor them. Plus, the nun that made history in sports, how she helped other athletes for decades. And the walk-up dance scene around the world. You remember this video. Who is that little slugger? <laughs> we meet him. Plus, our most heartwarming videos of the week. You're watching The Uplift. You've made me smile. Hey there, I'm Tony DeCopo. Welcome to The Uplift. That's the show that lifts you up for at least the next 30 minutes. Don't go anywhere because we're going to begin with our most heartwarming videos of the week, beginning with Little Hunter, who finished kindergarten, and afterwards he just had to see someone very important who made a big impact on his life. That would be Detective Duncan from the Cherokee Sheriff's Department. That is in Georgia. When Hunter was two, here's the backstory. Duncan found him drowning in a pool, pulled him out, performed CPR, really saved his life. This kindergarten graduation likely would not have happened if not for that officer. And there you see the hug between Hunter and Duncan. Very sweet. What a milestone. To our next story, take a look at this. Justin is fighting a rare and very aggressive form of cancer, and he thought he was going to get his regular treatment on one particular day. But that day was also his 11th birthday. So this happened. Next to these two. <laughs> The staff at his children's hospital surprised him with a birthday party to take his mind off the cancel, cancer battle. And uh, fair to say it had an impact. Look at this little guy. So sweet. All right, now it can often be difficult for parents get, to get their kids to eat, but a three-year-old named Stella said she didn't like her mom's cooking, uh, and it was her big sister who had some follow-up words for her. Take a look. People have to live on the street and not have a home that has food in it. So you have to be blessed that you have a home and food and everything. Okay? I don't like food. Aiden, you're gonna live in in a in um the street then. You're gonna have in the that. I don't, I don't like food too much. I don't want to watch my napkin on the couch. Eat or go to the street. <laughs> Period. <laughs> It's a lot. Wow. Okay. All right. Uh, hopefully she ended up uh, on the couch and the couch stayed in the house and she was watching that iPad. <laughs> I don't think she finished the meal. Uh, okay. Kids often go viral. They go viral for a lot of silly things. Uh, and you probably caught video of that showboat who captured the attention of millions with that uh, walk-up dance. Take a look. Here's a reminder. Yep. Coming up, we're going to have the story behind that famous walk-up brought to us by CBS Sacramento's Adrian Moore, it just keeps going on and on. If confidence is key in baseball, this little guy's got a bright future. That's Ben Sadlowski with the Manteca T-Ball Cubs, busting out just about every dance move in the book on his walk up to the plate. His mom, Monica, says the season ending show was no surprise. Every last game we do a walkout song for each player. I, I wasn't expecting him to do all that, but it's not uncommon for him. <laughs> That's his own thing. He's just a goofy guy. <laughs> so we had to ask, where did Ben learn those moves? I mean, I'm kind of I'm kind of goofy myself, so <laughs> he might have picked it up from me, but it definitely was not his father. I can, I can assure you that. And it wasn't just Ben's boogie that was a hit. His performance made even more impressive with a single to left field. And while there's no scorekeeping in T-ball, Monica says the comments she's received on social media prove Ben's brilliant show made millions of people feel like a winner. And everybody was just like, man, I was having a really bad day, and, and that just made my day so much better. And I'm like, man, that's, 
That's awesome. <laughs> Pretty good piece of hitting there. Look out, coach pitch. Coming up, two artists who wanted to help Ukraine but thought they had little to give. Well, here's what they came up with. Isn't it pretty? And the amputee who set out on a mission to run 104 marathons in 104 days. Plus, the history-making nun and the job she got in 1977 that allowed her to help countless athletes for decades. Don't go anywhere. You're watching The Upload. Now, about that runner who wanted to run 104 marathons in 104 days, well, she's an amputee, lost her leg due to cancer. Did she accomplish her mission? Mark Strassman has our story. Marathoners typically run on two legs and grit. Jackie Hunt Bruchma does it on one. I didn't want to be an amputee. I was like, this is not my life. I'm just going to be normal. 20 years ago, at age 26, the South African native got bone cancer a tumor near her left ankle. Within three weeks, I went from cancer diagnosis to having my leg amputated, and I was like, no, I'm going to fight this. From the beginning, your mindset was, this will not limit me. I was very stubborn. <laughs> Still am. <laughs> but you need beyond stubborn to run marathon after marathon, day after day. Jackie's journey this year. In all, 104 marathons in 104 days. She raised almost $200,000, enough to buy running blades like hers for 50 para-athletes. People are going to look at you and go, yeah. are you crazy? <laughs> I had to, like, convince myself, yes, this is crazy, but you can do it. So your messages were all capable of so much more? Yes, that's exactly my message. You just go and try something hard, something that's personal to you. 102 marathons in 102 days. Jackie Hunt Bruchma challenged herself and stuck to it for the long run. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and yeah, she could do it. Well done. All right, moving on to our next story. When tragedies like the war in Ukraine go down, a lot of people feel hopeless. Well, two artists from Minnesota wanted to help but didn't have a lot of cash to give. But they can make art, so they gave that. Nacha Larno has that story. Art can often have a big impact not just on the artists or a viewer, but sometimes on people around the world. Interact Center in St. Paul, Minnesota, helps local artists with disabilities express themselves through art, and some of their creations may have a global impact. My, you know, 40 years of working with artists with disabilities, um, I've, they're just very empathetic people, period. Most of them have lived through some very difficult trauma or, or just have been discriminated against when they were young. They have big hearts, they have big hearts. And now they're giving back because they are creators now. I mean, that's one of the beautiful things that happens here. Interact opens its studio doors to dozens of artists with disabilities who want a space to create their own work or to collaborate with others. Artists Jill Reedy and Vicky Lacroix wanted to use their work for more, specifically helping Ukrainians. It breaks my heart seeing what's going on over there. And, um, you know, I'm often in tears watching the news and, and just feeling like, what, you know, what can I do? What, what can one person do? I finally thought, okay, I can't fix it. I can't stop it. But what can I do? They asked if they could put their works up for sale, with 100% of the proceeds going to a charity that benefits Ukraine. Interact agreed. I know that doing art um, and selling a couple of prints is not going to make a huge difference, but I think it's the drop in, a, in the bucket. And I think that um, energy follows intention. So, um, you know, if, if many of us do a drop in the bucket, you know, then we're going to be able to bring them a full bucket. I like that. Energy follows intentions. Good piece of wisdom there. All right, coming up, more wisdom, including graduation season, some stories about unique grads. One of them, take a look, doesn't look like her classmates, a little bit older. That's because she's 84, and her degree is 67 years in the making. Why bother? We'll tell you what was on her mind. Also, the graduates who couldn't go to their high school ceremony nearly 80 years ago for a very dark reason 
what the kids at Mount Diablo did to honor them in spirit all these years later. standard path for a college graduate goes middle school, high school, then college. Maybe you're in your 20s when you get your diploma. Well, the star of our next piece waited a little bit longer. She's a recent grad of the University of Minnesota, and it took her 67 years to finally get that degree. She's a little bit older than the other students, you could say so. CBS Minnesota's Marielle Mose has her story. Betty Sanderson. <laughs> it's just pure joy, pure joy. She's your satisfaction that I had attained my goal of walking across Northrop. Becky Sanderson left Renville, her small farm town in central Minnesota, as the first person in her family to go to college. This is my letter of acceptance, dated July 7th, 1955. She went to the University of Minnesota to get her license to be a nurse, a program that only took her a year. This is my graduating class from the nursing. She continued taking college courses, but was eventually taken off course when she met her husband and followed his career moves, never finishing her degree. I was about 25 credits, approximately 25, 28 credits short when I started that. After raising two daughters and pursuing a decades-long nursing career, she eventually retired in 2013. I was out to lunch with friends and I we were talking about bucket lists and things we wanted to do and somebody I said I've always wanted to graduate from the U. Determined to make that happen Betty enrolled in classes at the U of M in fall of 2018 where her second time around was a lot different. This is the University of Minnesota when I was here there was no West Bank you can see the parking lots that are now all buildings. A larger campus is one thing, but technology was her biggest obstacle. That computer business just almost did me in. Going virtual during the peak of the pandemic nearly stopped her. I had to drop both classes that I tried to take online. I couldn't do it. But on May 7th, she did it. You need to do what you want to do or what your goals are. Don't let anybody stop you. I get it. I'm all for it. Congratulations, Becky. Well done. And that computer business comes for us all. All right, we're going to turn now to another unique graduation. This one at Mount Diablo High School in Concord, California, where students brought lessons from their history class to their graduation. CBS San Francisco's John Ramos has the story. In 1942, all people of Japanese descent in California were rounded up and sent to internment camps. That included Mount Diablo football player Tatsuki Tats Kanada, who became known as Uncle Tuffy to his nephew Gordon Kanada. Was he a tough guy? He seemed like it. He was uh, kind of stocky, but he was always very gentle. With it. But the internment denied a number of kids the chance to graduate from Mount Diablo, so tonight those students, most of whom, like Tats, are no longer living, will be ceremoniously granted their diplomas. He would uh, be honored and blown away by such an occasion. Something that's happened 80 years ago, people don't really think about it. But it's all happening because Laura Valdez's students did think about it. Two years ago, a camp survivor and Mount Diablo alum named Kimmy Dowell suggested the idea, and the history and ethnic studies students went to work, first learning the story of the camps, and then lobbying the district to award the retroactive diplomas. Oh yeah, they flooded their email. They said that there wasn't a day that went by that they didn't get another email at the top of the, at the top of their email list. Well, I was just writing about the effects afterwards and like what not having a diploma affected their lives. The injustice of the internment seems obvious, but it really hit home for the students to learn about others their age who never had the chance to graduate with their friends. I'm working hard for my diploma, right? And imagine them like working hard just for them to not get one. It's just that would get me so mad, so sad. Curtis Banks was impressed with the dignity the internees showed during the ordeal. Those who signed up to fight for this country, like Tats and his three brothers, as well as those who stayed to help their family members in the camps. Unity is a big key in that too. They like helped each other, helped one another, treated people like how they wanted to be treated. Now the students are doing the same, fighting to honor others the way they would like to be honored. And in this case, they're not just learning history, they're correcting it. 
it's the least we could do. It's the least we could do to um, help them feel a little bit better about the bad times. In Concord, John Ramos, KPKP. One of the darkest chapters from America's past, one of the brighter moments from this graduation season. Well done, Diablo High School. All right, coming up, the military mom who was desperate for a wheelchair accessible car, it's for her son. That's all she wanted, she got a whole lot more. Plus, the nun known for her job in athletics and what she did to become such a sports trailblazer. A lot of trophies there. It is long and often said that it takes a village to raise a child. Well, one military mom knows exactly how true that is. Her son has cerebral palsy and balancing motherhood and her career can be difficult. But fortunately, there were people in her corner there to help. Caitlin O'Kane now has her story. Cassidy Spinelli was deployed overseas in the Navy when she gave birth to her son, Dante. He was born at just 36 weeks and taken to the NICU. He was given an MRI, and that's how we knew, oh my gosh, tears already. <laughs> um, that's how we knew he um, was given the diagnosis of cerebral palsy. After six weeks, they were medevaced to San Diego. Her life was changed forever, but she was determined to care for her son and continue her career. She eventually completed her active duty and is now in the Naval Reserve. You know, you never, you never get pregnant um, thinking that you will have a child um, such as Dante, but um, I, I can say he's my biggest blessing. He has taught me nothing but patience and true love and compassion. I had zero patience before Dante. <laughs> oh. As a reservist, she was still doing double duty as a mom and as a mobilized member of the Navy. Um, I had one thing in my mind um, when, when I was uh, mobilized and that was to, to save money to get a wheelchair accessible vehicle for Dante. I mean, prior to mobilization, I, I, I was really struggling to get him in and out of the car. Um, and so, so I went on mobilization with that, with that focus. I was gonna go save money and, um, you know, do what I needed to, to do for Dante. She was connected with the Semper Fi in America's Fund, which helps wounded or ill service members and their families get the care they need. The fund helped Cassidy get the wheelchair accessible car she desperately needed. And that's not all. Over the years, her case manager, Sierra, has become a friend. Uh, wow, throughout the years. I mean, hospital stays, Sierra sends me um, gift cards. She sends me care packages, sends gifts for Christmas. Um, they're like the family you never knew you had. It's a really great feeling to, to be able to hear from a service member and go, you know what, I get to fix that for you. Um, you kind of feel like Oprah. <laughs> It's, it's a great feeling. One of the things Sierra helped Cassidy with was moving her and Dante across the country to Pennsylvania. Oh my gosh, when they got on the airplane to fly from California to Pennsylvania, I was like a hot mess. Um, <laughs> I was so worried about them and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Um, it's, it's a great feeling to be able to um, create relationships with people. Um, you know, aside from the, the financial assistance, just to create relationships with people. Um, I think the feeling's mutual. I feel like, you know, they're a part of my family. It takes a lot of strength to do what Cassidy does in the Navy and as a single mom, but it also takes a village and Sierra is that village. You know, if I'm having a rough day or we're having a great day, I can reach out to Sierra and I know she's, she's like my lending ear and my shoulder to cry on. Cheering both of them on, the whole family and that community. Congratulations on a job well done, getting that vehicle and so much more. Okay, close your eyes and say the words sports trailblazer. What comes to mind? Probably not a 78-year-old nun, but that is what you get with sister Lynn Windsor. Park Strassman now once again with her story. 
at Xavier College Prep, a dynasty in Arizona high school sports. The real champ is a 78-year-old nervy nun. This is what Xavier's all about, right? Yeah. Sister Lynn Windsor. You have force of personality. Yes. Fair to say? I would say. That energy is what you threw behind these sports. More opportunities for girls is what it's all about. Sister Lynn, a 1961 alum here, became Xavier's athletic director in 1977, determined to put Title IX into action. And so we sat down and we said, we got to make things change. You put in a lot of sports. Yes, we did. So how about getting soccer going? How about beach volleyball? This month, Xavier's softball team won it all. The school's 145th state championship across a dozen sports since Sister Lynn took charge. We don't win everything. I mean, you look Doesn't at look it. Senior Riley Flynn will pitch for Harvard this fall. Her attitude is contagious, and you know, she's got that champion attitude. You know, we're going to win. Our motto is women of faith pursuing excellence. So when we get into something from day one, we want to excel. <laughs> but having fun and making friends is the, for girls, it's the most important thing. Hit the ball. This nun turned winning into an article of faith. Mark Strassman does it again. That's our show. I hope it brightens your day. I hope it lifted you up. In fact, I know it did. If it didn't, better replay it. It's all free. It'll make you feel good. We'll see you next week with more good news. You've been watching The Uplift.